Well, I love where we are today, uh, and I, I really do mean that. We're in the middle of this, this collection of talks where it's simply called Confident. And I've been thinking about this, this idea all week that well-placed confidence may be the greatest asset we have as humans. And, and what I mean by that is the, the right kind of confidence in the right place. It, it opens our eyes to see that God's put us in places and given us opportunities in the kingdom of God that we, we never could have manufactured on, on our own. Or to say, say it a different way, well-placed confidence, and confidence is just another word for faith, well-placed faith in God, it opens up a gateway for our life to live the kind of life that God blesses. And, and conversely, is also true, when we have misplaced faith, and, and usually misplaced faith is usually back on ourselves, it's back on other people. It's back on situations. Misplaced faith also opens up gateways that's usually filled with kinds of regret and consequences that we have to live with the, the rest of our life. So let me give two, two points of clarity, and then we're going to unpack this idea. Uh, the first is this. I, just, I want you to know our firm belief in God's sovereignty. We, we believe, and I think the scripture teaches, that God is sovereign. He is over and above all the universe. He is holding creation together with the word of his mouth and his strong right arm. And he has written every story. He, he knows how your story and how my story is going to roll out. But at the very same time, God gives every one of us a gift every day. And, and the gift is simply this, is you and I get to choose where we place our confidence. That's the gift that he gives every one of us. Today, we get to decide where the energy and the equity of our life is going to be spent. And if that confidence is put on God, then it opens up doors for us to see that God does impossible things, what we'd consider impossible. God restores relationships. God makes a way for people and for situations and circumstances for his son to be glorified in ways we could never do on our own. Okay, so that's point number one of clarity. Second point of clarity is simply this, is that today's talk is not about decisions. I, I know it, it may feel that way on the front end, but I do want you to know God does care about your decisions. And, and the reason is he knows, just like you know, is that every decision, every choice that you and I make, it leads somewhere. It takes us somewhere, right? When you and I make a decision, it, it, it even if it's a decision you're not thinking about, uh, that decision is going to take you to a destiny. It's going to take you to a destination. And so God cares about even the little decisions. He cares about what major you, you have. He cares about what job you take. He cares about where you live. He cares about your retirement. He cares about every sacred second of your life. But here's the key. God is not so interested in you putting confidence in your plan. God's much more interested in you putting a confidence in a person. And that person, because he's so good, he is perfectly good, wherever he takes you and wherever he leads you is always going to be for your best, always going to be for your flourishing in this life, okay? So we're going to, I want to hold this banner over our house today, Isaiah 26, 8. And uh, just as a heads up, this is a, a, a verse that's been maybe most precious to me um, among a handful of others over the course of the last 30 years. This is a verse that is, is regularly inviting me. It's going to invite you into a place of deeper confidence. It's going to invite you and I to deeper waters, to, to walk in deeper places with God, to say yes to him again and again and again and again. And, and so even though you might say, well, I've already said yes to Jesus, Jesus is inviting you into better yeses, into more yeses, into deeper yeses, into yeses that impact your entire life, that bring you into the deep waters and to the deep deeper wells of sweeter water over your life. And so I, I want to read this verse. We're going to unpack this. Here's how Isaiah, he starts this, this verse with just some dynamite. He says, yes, Lord, exclamation point. And so just, I think it's helpful just to stop and just say that may be the most appropriate word for us today if you're moving towards God today. If you're moving towards him with some measure of confidence, the most appropriate word you can say to him is yes. With an exclamation point, maybe, or maybe a, a period, maybe a semicolon. You're like, I'm not exactly sure. I'm going to say yes. But the, the point is this, is no matter what season of life you're in today, and I don't know where you are, you might be in a, a real deep well of despair. You might be feeling uneasy about your future or your marriage or about an illness or a diagnosis or whatever it is. You might be a church person. You might be feeling suspicious of the church. Here, here's what you can 
hold on to today, you don't have to be suspicious of God. You might want to be suspicious of church people or the church. I, I, can't, I can't hold that out for you. But you, you don't ever have to be suspicious of God. And the reason is that God is supremely good and he can be trusted. You can always put a deeper level of confidence again and again in God and what he says over your life. And so it, it makes sense that the people of God would say yes. Because I know he's good. I know he's always going to lead me to places of flourishing. So what, what this means in a different way is it's you and I with a kind of confidence and courage to say, okay, today in saying yes, I'm surrendering all that I am to God. And this isn't church talk. It literally means I'm surrendering my life. I'm surrendering my time. I'm surrendering my ambitions. I'm surrendering my affections. I'm surrendering my disappointments. I'm surrendering my anger. I'm surrendering the unease that I have with life. I'm surrendering all that it is because I know if I surrender it to you, you're always going to take this and redeem it and move me into a place of greater hope, greater joy, greater flourishing over my life. And so all of us are on that path of either saying yes to God or saying maybe to God or saying no to God. And, and I would imagine most of us in this, in this moment would go, yeah, I'm, I'm down. Sign me up. I want to say yes to God. Um, but here's the problem. If I can present sort of the challenge for us, all of us would say, yes, I think, I think I can say yes to God today. But if you'd be honest, I mean, look in, look in the mirror this morning or when you get home and just, just make the confession. We're a bunch of control freaks. Like every one of us. Like I'm the king of control freaks, right? And, or Ashley's the queen, right, of, of the control freaks. And you guys are all the poppers of the you know, control kingdom. We're a bunch of control freaks, right? And so what happens is when we say, God, I'm going to say yes to you, and I'm going to put two exclamation I mean, you know, Isaiah only put one exclamation point. I'm going to put two exclamation points. That's how serious I am about saying yes to you and putting confidence in you. But what we do is we put a disclaimer on that. And we say, I'll say yes as long as you, you give me a preview of my future. As long as you, you can make the promise that, that my life is not going to be filled with pain. It's going to be conflict-free. It's going to be smooth all the days of my life. If you can promise that, it's a double exclamation. It's a triple exclamation point on that. Yes, I say yes to you all day long. And God's like... I can't, I'm not going to make that promise to you. In fact, my son made a different promise in John chapter 16 where he says, in this world, this is promise number one, in this world, you will have trouble. trouble. You're going to have lots of trouble. Promise number two, though, he says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So the, the, what we can hold on to today is if you're alive, if you're breathing air on planet Earth today, you're going to have some pain. Some of you are walking in that right now. You're walking in a lack of equilibrium. You're curious about the next step that God's going to lead you in in your life. And so you know about pain. You know about disappointment. You know about loss. But what Jesus says is if you'll say yes to me, I'm not saying you're not going to have pain and loss and things aren't going to go bad for you because, hello, you're human. It's part of the human experience. But if you say yes to me, what you're getting is I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. I'm always going to move towards you, and you're going to know my presence in such a unique way in those moments when you say yes to me. And so again, every one of us are on this path of either saying yes to God or we're saying no to God. And so Isaiah is saying, please say yes to God. Yes, Lord, walking in the ways of your truth. So when, when we come and we're part of the family of God, it, it becomes a more natural expression for us. It becomes part of our worship today to say yes to him. I mean, I don't know if you were experiencing that in those 25 minutes together where it just naturally flows. God, I'm going to say yes. God, for all that you've done for me in canceling 10,000 no's over my life, I can say yes to you. But when we say yes to God, we're also saying yes to his truth. Now, here's the thing. We're living in a time right now where you, I would imagine you've heard people say something like, um, this is my truth, and, and what is your truth? And, and hear me. I'm not offended by that. I hope you're not offended by that. Um, but for the people of God, it becomes a natural expression of surrender when we say yes to you. I, I'm, I'm saying yes to you, God, 
And I'm also saying yes to your truth because I know that your truth is better than anything I could imagine. Your purposes over my life are always going to be better. Your purposes are always gonna lead me to places of flourishing. It's always gonna lead me to places of good over my life. Listen to how the psalmist, he sort of echoes this. It's one of my favorite verses. If you're memorizing scripture, I hope that you are. This is a verse you're gonna to wanna to put on your list. He says, Psalm 86, 11, he says, teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. I mean, I could spend 30 minutes just on this verse. I'm not going to. But just that first phrase I love so much because it, it personalizes this. It reminds us that God is not some objective reality out in space. He says, teach me your ways. You, you know what that means? It means God has ways. God has a personality. God has preferences. God has things that he loves. God has things that he hates. God has, has, a, has a bent in the universe. And so the psalmist is like, my ways, they're not working for me. So I want to know your ways. Your ways are so much more beautiful than my, I want to know your ways. And I want to know your truth. Because I know your truth is, is going to lead me somewhere. So he says, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. So that's a theme that we see all throughout the scripture. Because it's not enough just to know the truth. Now, if you're, if you're new to Hope City, we're serious about the truth. Like, we're serious about the scripture. I mean, if, you, if this is your first time, you're probably going to hear it 10 more times in the next 10 weeks if you come back. Like, if we, we say things like, if you're memorizing scripture, and I hope that you are, and the reason is because we hope that you are. And the reason is because the truth is what sets us free. But it's not just about knowing the truth. Like, you can memorize a thousand verses and still be an enemy of God. It's about walking in the truth. Now, the question, I mean, at least I asked, was like, why, why again and again in Scripture do we see the verb walking or walk, like walk in this? And I think the reason is because walking, it, it reminds us, like, we're going somewhere. Walking takes you somewhere. In the same way that our decisions and our choices take us somewhere, God's like, I want you to know the truth, and I want you to walk in that truth. And here's the thing, and I think we can just make this confession. Like truth doesn't necessarily mean we understand it. It just means it's God's ways. Sometimes God's truth is going to put us at odds with culture. And we got to go, I, I, I got to be okay with that because his truth is still better. His ways, his purposes are still better over me. And I know that his truth, his ways, his purposes are always going to take me somewhere that I couldn't go on my own like wholeness and forgiveness and flourishing and right relationships. Like I can't get there on my own, but when I anchor my life to his purposes and to his truth, he always leads me to those places. Uh, let, let me put it this way. Um, my, my title, I could, and if you're new around, we do not do titles around here, okay? Um, but if you go on the website and you'd be like, oh, he's the, the, the title's lead pastor, right? Um, that doesn't mean anything, by the way. It just, we just needed a title, right? It, it could have been chief toilet washer, really would be a, a more accurate maybe term. But um, a, a, a real more accurate um, role that I accomplish here at Hope City is I'm, I'm primarily the lead steward. I mean, that's not something we would put on our website because it sounds weird. But I'm the lead steward because um, what a steward does, it's the reminder that I'm not the owner, right? I don't own the joint. Right, like this isn't my church. When people go, oh, it's your church. I'm like, it's not my church. I mean, like, I don't, I'm not king. I'm not the ruler. I mean, there is, is one king and one ruler. His name is Jesus. And he, he is literally in charge. And this is not church talk, I promise you. And so my, my role, along with our, our pastors and our elders, is to steward. I'm the lead steward, though. And, and what that means is a steward, if you're, if you're interested in this kind of language, what a steward does is he, he manages or she manages someone else's property. Like I, my role is to manage what God has given to us on loan. And so this is, if we say this is like our house. And, and so my role is to, to say, okay, we're gonna manage the house for the master. Because he's, he's here and he is coming back. There is that tension in the kingdom. He's coming back, but he's also here by his spirit. But he, he, let, me, let me say this in a, weird, in a way that's probably not weird to you, okay? Because that does sound kind of weird, okay? Here, here's, here's what we really mean. When I, when, I, when I take seriously this role of being lead steward, I'm asking the question every weekend, 
what kind of church does Jesus want to be part of? And I don't mean just like what kind of service does Jesus want to come to, because that's a dumb question, okay? Because the, the service, the gatherings, are like 1% of what we do, 1% of who we are. So the question is, is what, kind of, what kind of people do we want to, to become? What kind of, of church does Jesus want to be part of? And, and I know that can be answered in a hundred different ways. But one of the ways that that gets answered is that, God, I want us to be a people. I want us to be a house that regularly says yes to you. That's the kind of people that God inhabits. That's the kind of house that God loves to live in where his people regularly put themselves in a position where we say, I'm willing to say yes to you and I'm willing to say yes to your truth. Even though your truth is hard, even though your purposes are gonna take us to places of discomfort, your purposes are gonna take us to places that are gonna stretch us or cost us our life. I'm gonna say yes to you and God says, those are the people that I wanna be around. Those are the people that I want to embolden. Those are the people that I want to fund. Those are the people that I want to give resources for because they're saying yes to my purposes. Let me say it in a different way. Part of being a steward, and and by the way, I'm the lead steward, but we're all stewards. Everybody's got their own house. But one of the ways, in, in, at least in our context, of what it means to be a steward is, is you and I making the confession. When we say yes to God, when we say, God, I'm surrendering my life, what we're saying, in, in contrast, is saying, God, I can't believe you would take somebody that's so broken, so fractured, so inconsistent, so what, and you guys have no idea. You have no idea how insecure, I struggle with anxiety, I've got all sorts of stuff going on. I just, I like, it's, just, it's just part of the human experience. I, can't, I, can, I can pray all day long, and it's just like, it just drives me to deeper dependence. I, it's, all, it's all it's doing. But when we say yes to God, it's us going, God, I can't believe you'd use somebody that's so broken, so fractured, so insecure, so, has so many shortcomings, so sinful, so, so dark in the dark moments. I can't believe you'd use somebody like this. And God's like, yeah, I, I love to take all of that, throw that in the mixing bowl of grace, put it in this oven of redemption. And I, what comes out is this cake that is served to the city. And the city who is who is, generally speaking, the majority of the people in our city do not know Jesus, the city's like, how does that work? How, how, how can this God you guys are talking about take such broken people and make their marriages so powerful? How can he take such a fractured person and put a supreme destiny over their life? How, how can he, he take a person that ha- has jacked up and torpedoed their own life with drugs and then give them a platform for other people's redemption. I mean, like, people are watching on how does that work, and God's like, that's the cake I love to serve the city. And I, I just tell you that because maybe the greatest evangelistic tool we have in the city is not all the outreach programs we do. Yes to those. The primary way that we evangelize our city is by saying yes to him personally, by letting God supernaturally transform our lives. By letting him transform our marriages, by, by walking in freedom over our addictions, by having him transform our marriages, by saying no to these things that are torpedoing, killing us, and saying yes to the, the very thing that's going to cause us to come to life supernaturally. And so Isaiah says, yes, Lord. I want to just make a quick turn. Let's go to John chapter 12. And uh, I love this passage so much. Jesus is, uh, he's heading towards the cross. He, he's not quite there, but he's heading to the cross and his disciples just don't get it. They don't really understand the redemptive plan of, of Jesus. So he's constantly having to remind them. And he's like, you guys are such dumb dumbs. Like, do you not get it? And so he says this in John chapter 12, verse 23. He says, He's speaking this to his disciples. He says, the hour has come for the Son of Man. He's talking about himself. For the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, again, they don't get it. They hear glorified, and they're like, oh, Jesus is about to get on a throne. That's what glory is. And so who's going to get on his right? Who's going to sit on his left? And Jesus is like, you guys are, you guys are idiots. You guys are so, such dum-dums. Like, this is a yes to that glory, ultimately. But there's a different kind of glory that you're about to experience and he, he explains it. He, he opens their eyes. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, 
it remains alone. Now, by the way, that's a person that, that says no to God. He says, you're a seed and, and you die and you die for yourself and you live for yourself. He says, you die alone. That's a person that says no to God. But he says, he's about to explain what it means to say yes to, to God. But he says, but if it dies, meaning you, the seed, if it dies, it bears much fruit. Because whoever loves his life, that's saying no to God, loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world, that's saying yes to God, will keep it for eternal life. Now listen to his closing words. He says, Father, glorify your name. Okay, so here's what Jesus could have said. Jesus could have been like, Father, save me. Save me from the cross. Like, I don't want to go. It's going to be filled with pain and loss, and it's awful. I know it's coming. He didn't say that. He's like, I, and the reason I signed up for this thing, I could have pressed the eject button on this a long time ago, but I'm going to say yes to this, and here's why. Look what he says in verse 27. He says yes to this because he says, it was for this hour that I came. And so he says, glorify your name. Here, here's what Jesus was saying then, and here's, here's what I think he's saying over our house today. And I think what he, his desire is to cause an echo in our, in our own hearts today. He wants you and I to be able to say yes to him. Meaning, he wants us to be able to say, okay, I want my five-second story here on planet Earth to be joined with a, a much larger story, a redemptive story. I want my life, I want the people around me, I want the people that I love, the people that I don't know, the people that are watching. I want all people to know how good my God is, how generous, how kind, how merciful. When I look around my life, I'm just like, I cannot believe how good my life is. And not because everything is good in my life, but because everything has the fingerprints of God on it. And I want everybody in my life just to know how good he is, that God is not out to take something from them, but he's out to give them something. Our God's not a taker, he's a giver. Our God's a servant king. And when that dynamite of revelation goes off in our head and goes off in our heart, all of a sudden, saying yes becomes a privilege. Saying yes becomes another gift every day. Oh, I get to say yes to you again? I get to open this gateway of blessing and privilege and honor and your presence in my life just by saying yes to you and so yes I'm going to join my five second tiny whisper of a story and I get to join it with a glory that will be inextinguishable or is it inextinguishable sure. <laughs> it will not be extinguished for all eternity our story gets to be joined with his glory that's what happens when we say yes to him. And so it makes sense when Isaiah says this. He finishes this. Yes, Lord, walking in the way of your truth. We wait for you. Again, I don't have time. But that phrase is so important because he's like, when, when you're striving, when you're trying to, when you're saying yes to you, you're never going to wait for God. But when we say I'm waiting for you, what we're saying is I just, I know you have something for me. I might be in the middle of a storm, but I know respite's coming. And so I'm going to wait for you. And he says, and when that happens, the natural result is your name and your renown become the desire of my heart. Let, let me put it this way. All of us have defining moments in our life, every one of us. Um, if you're a, a follower of Jesus, your first defining moment would, I would imagine, would be the moment you first said yes to Jesus. Whether it's 40 years ago or 20 years ago or 10 months ago, and you said, that was the day I said yes to Jesus, and, and I trusted that his work on the cross, taking my place and forgiving me my sins and putting me in the family of God and making a way for me in this life and in eternity, when I said yes to him for the first time, like it changed everything. Maybe not all at once, but man, he is, he, it was an amazing moment. I'll never forget it. It was a defining moment for me. And then I would imagine, and I hope this is true for most of you, if you're a Christian, you'd say, but that was the first defining moment. And, and then I have hundreds of other, other defining moments where I learned to say yes to him in other areas. I mean, that was the most important defining moment, but then what flows out of that are, are 
hundreds, hopefully, of other defining moments of saying yes, where you realized, okay, he can be trusted with eternity, and if he can be trusted with eternity, he certainly can be trusted with my present. And so I'm just going to learn to say yes to him. And, and, and all of us, we had time and we could take a mic and we could say, you know, what, what were some yeses? All of us have got these stories. You say, oh man, I remember when I learned to say yes to God in my finances and I began to, you know, learn to, to give or to tithe and, and God, I was so worried that, that I wouldn't be provided for. And, and I said yes and all of a sudden, oh my goodness, God came through for me. God showed himself to be faithful. Or I remember when I was in a, a relationship and, and it was a sexual relationship and we weren't married and I knew, I knew God's ways. I knew God's truth. And, and I, I just, in a, in a moment of courage and confidence in his provision over my life, I just said, yes, God, yes, you're going to satisfy me. And, and I, I'm going to say no to my flesh. Or some of you, you look back and you're like, I, I remember I, I I was in college and I, I knew I wanted to be rich and so I was majoring in finance and then I just, the, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, I want you to be a missionary to Zimbabwe. And you're like, that sounds like a really big yes. But you said yes to God and, and, it, and, and whatever it is. I mean, like all of us have these stories where there are dozens and dozens and dozens of yeses. Yeses about your marriage. Yeses about your singleness. Yeses about your finances. Yeses about God's provision of your life. A, a yes over praying big prayers. And here, here, the reason I bring this up is yeses always beget more yeses. But no's always beget more no's. The more no's you, you say to God, the deeper unbelief flows in your life. The more you're like, God will not come through for me. God will not sustain me. God will not provide for me. God will not heal me. So the more we say no, the more we're actually just joining, we're coming into agreement with what the enemy says over your life. But the more we say yes to God, the more we say, God, you are able. God, I know you're able to heal. God, I know you're able to restore this marriage. God, I know you're gonna provide for me when I give. God, I know you're gonna protect me in, in this life as I go and I do missions. And even if I do lose my life, I have gained eternity because I've obeyed you. So I'm going to say yes to you because yes opens up this gateway of your blessing and your presence in my life. So I'm gonna say yes. I tell you that because, I, let me tell you my prayer. And I... And I and I don't, I don't say this to, to, to manipulate. I've shed tears over this this week. And I'd love to say I shed a lot of tears over you. I, I typically don't shed a lot of tears over like general press. That sounds terrible. But, but I've shed tears over this because I, my sense was this today. Is that some of you were, were going to say yes to, you, to, to God today. And it's, and, and it's going to be such a, a big yes because you've said no to this so many times. And it's gonna be it's gonna be a dam for you. Some of you, I, this, let me tell you one that I just I knew this morning. Some of you, you're walking in a marriage that is is it's on the edge, and you're like it's it's just too much work. It's too much work to go to counseling. It's too much work to repent. I I just don't I don't want to do it. And God today I think is gonna give you courage to say yes to yes to the work. Amen. And when you say yes, he's gonna give you grace for it. And your marriage in a year from now, you're gonna be like, I, if, if I would have kept saying no, I would be alone right now. Others of you, I really, this is the other, this is I too. One was, I, I really just, I'm believing for healing, physical healing today. Some of you have said no to an infirmity and I'm not saying God heals every infirmity all the time in this life. I know he doesn't. But he will in eternity. But, but he is healing infirmities in this life. He does heal the sick in this life. And so many of you, some of you, maybe one of you, you've just said no again and again and again and again and again. And you've, you've actually equated your sickness with a virtue. And it doesn't have to be. Your sickness may be an opportunity for a yes from God today. 
Now, just because I didn't hear something because I wasn't praying something for you doesn't mean there isn't a yes for you today. I think every one of us have a yes. Every one of us should walk out of here going, I'm saying such a big, scary yes, it's going to require so much courage. But God says behind that yes is victory. Why don't we stand together? Would you just, uh, just put your hands out with me. Let's, we're going to, it's just a posture of surrender. That's all it is. And if you don't want to do that, that's fine. But every, every person in the house today has a yes. And the, the yes is not designed to be a, a sacrifice. It's designed to be a gift to you. And so right now, I, I think the majority of us, we already know what the yes is. But others of you, if you're like, I don't know, then why don't you pray? God is faithful to tell you. What's your yes today? Father, we say yes to you. Saying yes to you. Because there's, there's not any life in the no. 